Okay, good afternoon. This is Emergent States of Matter, uh, written down here as, uh, on the live transcript as Emotional States of Matter. That's a pretty interesting uh, name for a course in the Department of Physics, um, but uh, there we go. So what we did last time was we uh, set up the problem of uh, an interacting Bose gas, uh, and we ended up uh, writing down uh, the formula for the uh, interaction part of the Hamiltonian. And that's, what, that's where we want to start uh, today. So what I plan to do is uh, explain now um, how we put this in normal ordered form and why we do that physically, which is often not explained in, in quantum field theory courses. And then we'll start uh, using perturbation theory and, and, uh, and go through the calculation. Now, the uh, I don't expect that you'll be able to follow in real time all the algebra that I'm going to be uh, doing. So the most important thing is that you are able to uh, follow along and understand what we're doing and why, and you know check up on the details and you know, two pies and things like that uh, uh, it, later in your in your own time. So the the starting point then is is this particular. Uh, expression for the interaction Hamiltonian. And, uh, and what I want to show now is, is that actually this uh, is uh, divergent and uh, we're going to need to remove uh, that divergence. Um, and in fact, that divergence is not even there uh, physically. It's, it's an artifact of the way we've set up the problem. So, so the way I want to, uh, to show you the problem so is, is I'm going to use the commutation relations to rewrite uh, our exact expression for the for the um, interaction Hamiltonian. So let's just put a box around it because we may want to come back to that uh, a little bit later. And uh, so let's just say uh, continue our notes by saying, uh, in in fact, this formula is divergent. And we're going to see the physical reason for this. And thus remove the divergence. Now the whole process of removing divergences in statistical mechanics and quantum field theory uh, has a, uh, you know, it has this sort of air of mystery about it, but in fact, it's completely physical. And uh, I, I want you to understand that it's not um, some sort of waving away in infinities kind of trick. So we'll, we'll, let's see, uh, let's see how that, how that comes about. So, so the step one of what I want to explain is let's, uh, let's um, uh, visualize carefully, visualize, um, So what I'm going to do is I'm going to rewrite the, the four uh, annihilation creation operators that you have here in the following way. I'm going to use the uh, commutation relations so that if I take the term AQ, AQ prime minus K, and this one has a dagger on it. Um, I can, so that's, that's this term uh, mm. that's this term right here let me let me put a make sure that you can see what i'm talking about so what i'm looking at is this term over here in in, in green I, can i i don't know if you can actually see that let me um let me make that a bit clearer for you so the, this uh, operator here in the middle uh I'm going to rewrite that. And the, the reason I want to rewrite it, you'll see, is I'm going to end up moving the dagger operator 
to the left of the non dagger operator. So uh, let's see why we can do that. Well, I can take this, this expression and I can write it as a dagger q prime minus k a q. So all I've done is swap the order around, but because of the uh, commutation relations, the Bose commutation relations, we know that, that the, the commutator of these two operators is just the delta function, uh, delta of q, delta q prime minus k. So that just comes from the uh, from the um, from the commutation of the commutation relations. So if I do that, then my interaction Hamiltonian has now the following form. It looks like this. It's a bit it's a bit long, but let's see if we can write it down uh, clearly. So it's uh, k q q prime. So these are dummy variables. They have the Fourier transform of the pair potential uk and then i have the um my operators now so let's write just write them straight down a q plus k dagger a q prime minus k dagger and then a q a q prime so that's that's uh just simply re uh, implementing this reordering in there. And then uh, what do I have left over? So I have the left over part is the is the uh, is this delta function here. So I have to so so this this expression in here is now replaced my what is the red box on the previous page by this blue box uh, on this page. And then of course I have this, this other term to add in here. And that other term is going to give me a, a delta function. So then I, I have to write Q and Q prime minus K are the same. And so if I do that, then what I get is this. So the same thing, one over two V. Now I've got three, summations, three dummy variables over here, this delta function is going to make one, one of them go away. So that will leave me with two, that'll be K and Q prime. So I'm going to write what is left in the following form. There's, there's that. And then what is left is the sum over Q prime of A Q prime dagger. A Q like that. Okay, so the first term is, is just some complicated uh, mess of, of operators, uh, but let's look at the last term because it's very easy to interpret what this means. So, so what this term means here is th th this this op this this thing here is in fact the Fourier transform of uh, of, of of U of K. Um, but with setting r is equal to zero. So, so look over here. Um, when, when I write down um, u, 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 of, u, uh, u of k, um, so that's uh, over here. So let's use a different color. So there's our Fourier, uh, our Fourier transform. If I set r equals to zero in this formula over here on the left, then that puts r equals zero in the uh, exp in the exponential, in the complex exponential. And so then what I have is just the sum over k of f of k. So this thing over here is just the pair potential evaluated at r is equal to zero. And then we have a factor of, uh, of one half. And then this term over here on uh, the, this last term. So this one also is very easy to interpret because this is just the number operator. So we're just looking at the total number of particles in the system. And so this is just N. And so what, we, what, what I've just shown you is that what this extra term is, is the interaction uh, energy at, at zero uh, times the number of particles in the system. And 
in our particular case, we might be having a hardcore repulsion, or we might have uh, Coulomb interactions or something like this. So, so in many uh, situations, such as hardcore repulsion, Coulomb, or Leonard Jones interactions. U at R is equal to zero uh, is actually divergent, is equal to infinity. So, so you might say, oh, well, that's really, uh, that's re really, really terrible. So uh, what we should do is we should just uh, maybe subtract off that infinity. Um, so, so, uh, so, um, so, 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 so you might say, we should just redefine the zero of energy. and write that the real uh, interaction Hamiltonian is equal to the original one. And then we've got this divergent term, so why don't we just subtract it? So say that a half u of r equals zero times n. And so we subtract that thing off, and then everything with respect to that divergent background uh, is, is, is finite. Um, and so, so that's 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 one um, approach. Uh, but th th this seems a little bit mysterious. Because we're subtracting infinity from our problem. And generally speaking, uh, we don't just want to subtract you know, infinite quantities uh, from the calculations that we're doing. So let's try to understand physically uh, where this comes from. So how did we get this, this problem in the first place? Well, usually whenever you run into a problem like this, the best thing to do is to look at the first line of the calculation, because probably you went wrong straight away at the beginning. And that of course is the case uh, here as well. So um, so, <coughs> so, what we did uh, was, the, was the reason we went wrong because we wrote the uh, interaction energy as um, rather rather carelessly, in fact, uh, in retrospect, as well, somewhere, where did we write it? Hopefully somewhere we wrote it down, there we go. We wrote it down over here and nobody complained about it. We wrote it as, uh, as the integral of um, d3r, d3r prime, uh, rho of r, rho of r prime, u of r minus r, r prime. And um, the, the, the point is that this isn't really what the pair uh, potential actually should be. Um, if, we, if, we, if, we, if, we, if we if we write the, if we write the fact that uh, rho of r is equal to, to uh, the sum of i equals one to n, rho, um, not rho, delta, So that, that, that's what the density operator uh, looks like. Um, then you can see that what, what this is, uh, this says that u is equal to the sum from i and j equal one to n of u of r i minus r j. So you might say, well, that's the pair potential, but actually it's not because um, the way 
that you that you learned from your mother's knee to write down the pair interactions uh, is 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 this following actually you normally write that u is equal to the sum of i not equal to j and then we avoid the double counting of u of ri minus rj and maybe we could have put a, a one half in here as well if we, if, we, if we wanted to but the point is that we always exclude the particle interacting with itself so this thing over here um, excludes self interactions we want different particles interacting with each other we avoid overcounting we certainly don't want to include them interacting with with each other and so and so what that means is that if i write down the formula that i have up up, up at the top um so so I, I i can i can then say that um that that this u is equal to the which is this again this thing the sum of i and j is equal to one uh to n of u of ri minus rj so this thing is equal to the sum of i not equal to j equals one to n of u of ri minus rj plus the term which is how many how many terms are there um which are where where we have the the the, the problem well when we have the self interactions i is equal to j so what that means is uh that we can write this as i equals to j there's n of those so there's n of those times the potential evaluated at, at zero so this is the these are the terms And, and of course, because i and j run from one to n, there are n of those. And when i is equal to j, then this thing uh, becomes equal to zero when i is equal to j. So the thing that we actually want then, so therefore the physical uh, quantity that should be in the Hamiltonian is actually the interaction Hamiltonian that we actually wrote down originally in second quantized form minus M U, U of zero uh, and uh, and, and in fact, uh, there should be a half in here. So you have the half like this. And so so this is what we should have been writing down all along. And so when we do the subtraction, then we get rid of this divergence term over here. So in summary, the physically correct statement is if I want to write down <coughs> the sum from i not equal to j u of ri minus rj that thing is equal in second in second quantization form to one over two v sum over k q q prime u tilde of k a q plus k dagger a q prime minus k dagger a q prime a q actually well those are the same so so in fact, let me just write this properly just to make sure i didn't confuse you 
Oh, I see why, why I got confused. Um, Okay, so that's the, so 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 that that's the important uh, point to remember that there's nothing mysterious about normal ordering, and there's nothing mysterious about subtracting off infinities because in fact they were never there in the first place. Okay, so now that we've now that we've got our um, our, our, our you know our system our, our calculation to be finite, uh, now we can. Um, we, we can proceed with our with our calculation, and um, what I'm going to do um, is I'm going to now slightly rewrite our our, our expression uh, in in the following way. So so now so now we have a finite. Uh, problem with no and physical divergences. So I'm going to uh, write the uh, Hamiltonian in a form that is easy to calculate with. So let me just go ahead and do that. So this is going to be where we start our calculation. So we have the kinetic energy like that. And then I'm going to write the potential energy term. Um, what, what I don't like is that the in this formula up here, you can see that there's weird arguments to these uh, annihilation and creation operators. And so I'd like to make them a bit more symmetric because it makes it more e easier to keep track of the, of the labels. So I'm going to write it like this, one over two V, and then I'm going to write it as, as the sum over K1, K2, K3, and K4. And I'm going to call them, the argument of this is going to be K1 minus uh, K3, like so. And then um, write the continuation of the equation down here, times now the annihilation creation operators. And I'm going to write them down like this, a k1 dagger, a k2 dagger, a k3, a k4. So doesn't that look much nicer? And then what do I have to do? Well, I have to um, put in uh, a delta function to make sure that the, that can convert the sum over four variables into what is up here, a sum over three variables, k, q, and q prime. So if you look at, look at the way I've defined the momentum variables, this is, a, is q delta of k1 plus k2 delta k3 plus k4, like that. So, so the picture that, that you have is, is, is essentially a, a kind of scattering process. I, do, I want to say it's like a scattering process. It isn't, it is, it is exactly a scattering process. Where what you think of is two particles come in something happens and then the particles come out. So I have the input particles K1 and K2, they come out with momenta K3 and K4 and something in the middle happens. So we'll call that bang. Uh, that's just the, the interaction. And what, what the, the technical name for that, for this term, for this interaction, this thing is called is called in quantum field theory, the S matrix. It's just a, 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 an operator that takes your incoming states to the left 
and your outgoing state to the right and maps one into the, into the other and that's what that's that's what we are um, what, that's what we are uh, what we are doing um, in, 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 in this in this problem so 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 we can see then that really the role of this delta function over here is that it conserves uh, it conserves momentum So if when I'm talking, as we go through the calculation, I say, oh, there's the momentum conserving delta function. Uh, that's what I mean. I mean that particular delta function and it, and it conserves uh, momentum. Okay, so now I'm going to tell you, uh, I, I'm now going to show you a simplification, uh, which, you're, which, which is always made, but it's extremely subtle and not obvious uh, why, why it is, was correct. Um, and so I want to uh, ex explain that. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to make a simplification. And that, that simplification is we're going to simplify the uh, pair potential. So I'm going to just tell you what the, what the result is, and then I'm going to tell you about the interpretation for it. But I'm not going to derive for you the result because it, it, that is quite complicated. Um, so let me, do, let me just tell you uh, what, what, the, what this simplification is. So the name of the simplification is we're going to use the, the um, pseudo potential approximation. So it's called a pseudo potential, just like it's like kind of quasi particle, right? You use the word quasi particle and you think, well, what the heck is that? It's something like a particle. So that's the quasi. And now we're saying that the particles aren't really what you think they are. And neither is the potential. The potential is not even the real potential. It's a pseudo potential or quasi potential, if you want. So what is it? What is that? What we're going to do is we, 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 we start off with a real potential, which is we have this term u of k1 minus k3 and u is u tilde. That's the actual Fourier transform of the real pair potential. And that's, that's the thing that is in our formula over here. Okay, so that's, uh, that, that's what we actually have. And what we're going to do is I'm going to replace this, this, uh, this Fourier transform by a constant. Okay, so uh, so instead of it being something that depends upon momentum, we're now going to make it something that is independent of momentum. And you can say, well, what value uh, should this constant be? So the, the trick is that we're going to choose this constant so that it gives the correct two particle amplitude in perturbation theory. So let me unpack that and explain what I mean. So we're going to choose this constant to give uh, the correct result we would have got if we had used the real potential in the Born approximation for scattering theory. So as you know from scattering theory, from advanced quantum mechanics, you take you take particle scattering, you decompose this thing into, into partial waves, and, and, and uh, it, it's quite you know, it's quite it's quite complicated, and the the um, when you when you do that, so what you what you find is that you get uh, an S wave scattering length, which I'm going to call A, and this U naught 
is related to the S wave scattering mode. So because we have a central potential, uh, we can um, we, we, we just have to really worry about, we're just going to worry in the lowest order approximation, the, the S wave uh, scattering. And so, so what we, what we, the formula that we end up with, it turns out, is U naught um, is equal to four pi uh, H bar squared over M times A, and A is the S wave scattering length. of the real potential. And that's going to be the only thing that matters in the far field of, of, the, of the scattering of, of the particles. And this is, um, I'm not going to derive it because I, some of you will, will, I don't want to spend you know, a week teaching you the, the quantum mechanics for this. So I'm just going to give you, for those of you who, who, who want to look this up, um, you can look in Landau and Lifshitz. Uh, look in Statphys Statistical Physics Volume Two. And it's in Section Six. Okay, so there, there, there's more than enough gory detail there. So, th so that's that's the approximation we're going to make. So we still have a lot of work to do, but the the potential is now being simplified. So now, so that's fine. So that's the statement of what we mean by a pseudo potential. So now what I want to talk about is uh, what, what, what's really going on physically here? What's the physical reason for this? So, so because in the textbooks, it's explained in terms of Feynman diagrams and, and, and scattering theory, which is you know, complicated, um, but, but there's a simple physical interpretation of what's going on. So I just want to give you uh, the physical interpretation. So the physical interpretation um, is that we are looking at, uh, at long wavelengths. We're looking at long, large distances. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to uh, replace the scattering from some complicated potential into the, the scattering from an effective point particle. So the physical interpretation is this, uh, what we're doing is we're scattering off this and we're scattering off an atom, say a helium atom, which has some structure. And what we want to do is we're going to replace that structure with a point particle. So in a sense, the first person who really worried about this was Isaac Newton. Uh, you'll maybe know that Isaac Newton uh, spent 11 years um, delaying the publication of his theory of gravitation because he wasn't able to figure out why it is legitimate to take the Earth and the Moon and then replace the Earth as if it was acting at its center and uh, the Moon as if it was all the mass was acting at its center too. And of course, eventually he figured that out. Um, and so this idea of scattering off an atom that has uh, that is that is in, which is extended in space and scattering off of, of a point particle, which obviously is not extended in space in space. So so that that requires some justification. And 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 so what do we really mean when we're doing this? Well, what we really mean is, is that by replacing uh, the actual atom by a point particle, um, we are looking uh, at the uh, at an effective long wavelength uh, description of our scattering process. So what we expect is that far away from the scattering event, We should not be able to detect the uh, fine structure 
of the scattering atom. So let's think about what the potential looks like. So the potential um, might look something like this. So this is distance. This is the, uh, the potential. Let's suppose that the real potential looks something like this. I don't know. Okay, so there's the, there's the potential. So what do we think the, uh, the wave functions are going to look like? Well, what we think the wave functions are going to look like is something like this. Over here, where the potential is varying very rapidly, we think that the wave functions are going to be doing something, you know, oscillating very rapidly. And then once I get into free space, then they're going to be, uh, they're going to be varying uh, relatively slowly because the potential is varying slowly. So what's, what, what basically you're going to get then is a rapid, a variation of uh, wave functions in uh, the place in the region where the potential has no structure and of course that's going to be on the scale uh, you know, of, of you know, an angstrom, a few angstroms, something like that. But we don't really care about that. We want to care. We care about what happens uh, uh, in the, in the far field. So, so we care about this distance. So we compare, we, we're interested in large distances compared to the atomic uh, core size. So essentially what we're, what we're doing then is if I, if I now redraw this graph now on the scales in which I actually care about. So here's R and here is sort of the, 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 the effective potential uh, that, I, that I see. So now what's happened is all of this structure here is just some blob at the origin. So everything that you can see as the structure is, is, is in the origin. And then what, ha what I see when I do my scattering is my particle comes in like that and the particles come out uh, like, like so. So all of the, all of the stuff that is, uh, all of the structure that is in here, all of the structure has been compressed into this little point uh, here at the origin, and so that's the that's the physical idea of what the of what is behind a, a pseudo potential. We're interested in the long distances, so we care about that we just see spherical wave scattering away from the uh, the, the scattering atom, and that's by looking at the S wave, we're looking at, at large scales, and so we shouldn't be able to see what's happening at the small scales, and so this is. Um, in fact, an example of taking a, a quantum or you know, physics problem and extracting the long wavelength effective uh, behavior of it uh, and throwing away what's happening at small scales where we're not interested in, in doing it. And you remember at the beginning of the class, you know, we talked very much about the idea of different levels of description in emergent states of matter. And so what we're seeing in this process is, the, is that this is an example. This is uh, an example of the idea in this class. So it's an example of emergent states of matter where we uh, are, are not interested in, uh, in, in a small scale levels of description. And so, so that means that there should be a way to think about this as a, in terms of the normalization group. And uh, there is a literature on that, but I have to say, um, at least the last time I looked at it, it wasn't tremendously good. So one of the things, one of the ways that you'll be able to tell 
if I've ever gone into a retirement is when I start writing papers on the normalization group uh, theory for the scattering of, uh, of weakly interacting bosons. So there, there should be a nice pedagogical renormalization group treatment of this, uh, but uh, there isn't really uh, one that I uh, recommend. There are some things, and maybe if people are interested, I can put those um, in, in the team chat. Okay, so now let's move on to, um, to, to, to do some real calculation. So let's now talk about how we deal with Bose-Einstein condensation. So, the, so we're going to be doing perturbation theory uh, about the uh, the non-interacting case. So we better understand the non-interacting case first. So let's solve that first. Okay, so what we know is going to happen is that we're going to get uh, Bose-Einstein condensation uh, into uh, a state of zero momentum. And so what we expect then is that if we were at zero temperature, we would have this, uh, this statement. We would have the number of particles in the ground state is, uh, is, uh, is equal to n, and the uh, number of particles in the um, excited states is equal to zero, as long as k is not equal to zero. So that's what we would, we would expect. So that's the idea of, of a Bose-Einstein condensation. So now what we, what we think is going to happen is that we're going to assume that this is essentially correct. When u naught is non-zero uh, and, uh, but now, what's going to happen is that instead of having all the particles into the condensate, we're only going to have uh, some particular fraction of them. So we're going to say that the number of particles in the condensate, yeah, what happened? What? Excuse me, let's pause this. Okay, so the number, the number of particles in the condensate Is, uh, is 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 n naught, and so 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 what I'm going to do is I'm going to rescale uh, the operators that tell you about the occupation in the ground state. So why do I want to do that? Well, I'm going to define uh, a naught dagger to be uh, the square root of n times b naught dagger, and similarly a naught is the square root of n times b naught. So we're going to make uh, those those definitions. So then, uh, why do I care about that? Well. If I now look at the commutator of these annihilation and creation operators, these new ones, then that's going to be equal, instead of it being one, because of the way I scaled it, it's going to be one over n. Okay, so what's nice is that if I now take the large n limit,
I take n goes to infinity. And so what that says is that, in, that basically b naught, b naught dagger commute. And if I take that limit, because they, they, they commute, then that says that the operators b naught and b naught dagger behave classically. So essentially what I'm saying is I've got a macroscopically occupied uh, quantum ground state, which I can treat uh, classically. And then I have non macroscopically occupied regularly, regular excited states, which have to be treated uh, fully quantum mechanically. But because there's so much occupation, uh, a macroscopically large number in the ground state, then I can treat uh, that uh, as equal to um, a classical uh, a variable. So we can treat them. Uh, when I say classically, what I mean is, in other words, i.e. as complex numbers, not operators. So uh, the way I'm going to write that is I'm going to uh, write uh, A naught and uh, A naught dagger as basically uh, being equal to uh, some constant, uh, a, a naught, will have um, some magnitude a naught, the size of a naught, which is going to be of order the square root of n, uh, so it's macroscopic variables. And so I'm going to now then separate out the ground state, which I treat classically, from the excited state, which I treat uh, quantum mechanically. So what does that mean? That means that if I look right down the field operator for the system, so psi of r is just the Fourier transform of the annihilation and creation operators, of course. So now what that's going to look like is the following. It's going to look like the ground state, which I'll write as a naught over the square root of v. And then one over the square root of v is some k not equal to zero, so excluding the ground state, just looking at the excited states, the e to the i k dot r times uh, a k like that. And so that's, uh, that's uh, you know, that's, that, that means that we can treat this as, as classical complex number. And this as quantum and therefore described by operators. So that's a psi of r. Uh, then we also know that the, that the number of particles in the system is conserved. So what that means is that the number of particles uh, is given by this. Um, by some the various terms. The number operator is like this. This is the number of particles in the ground state plus the number of particles in the excited state. So that has to equal uh, n. And so this thing here is the number of particles in the ground state. which is what we've called n naught. And then this thing over here is the number of particles in the excited state. Okay, so what are we going to do? How are we going to uh, calculate uh, what uh, the interacting Bose gas? So let's write down what the strategy is. So the idea is that the, that the, um, the, 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 the AKs, right, if I were to look at their, uh, their, their norms, so just look at the, the, the magnitude of them, So those are much smaller than the, the magnitude of the 
ground state, the A, A, A naught. So we're going to say that basically we've got nearly an ideal gas. So there's so the, the idea is that the, that the uh, the interactions are weak. So we've got a basically a ground state of bosons in the, in the condensate with a few dilute excitations above that. And those dilute excitations mean that there are a few scattering events, which means that the particles are dilute, uh, the low occupation number, there's, there's, there's there, or they're weakly interaction. So, so what that means is that we will do perturbation theory in the AKs. And we'll do that about the ideal Bose-Einstein condensate. So the way that we're going to order the terms in perturbation theory is going to be by the powers of the annihilation and creation operators. So, so essentially by that, which, which as you'll see is essentially in terms of the, of the potential. So we'll, we'll see that we'll see that that comes out. So, the, so that's that's the that's the idea. Now, what we are going to look at is we we want to try to see um, um, how we can solve this problem exactly. So this was going to give us a in general. This is going to be a hard. Um, interacting problem with uh, four powers of annihilation and creation operators. So that, that's going to be hard. But what we know is that if we have a, a, a second order Hamiltonian, i.e. Uh, no quartic terms, then we can actually di diagonalize that exactly. So let, let me just make sure that you're on the same page as me. So here we have our Hamiltonian up here in, in the pink, and you can see it has four powers of A, A daggers, A dagger, A, 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 and so on. So we don't know how to solve that. We don't know how to diagonalize that Hamiltonian and, and find its eigenstates and, and, and wave functions and so on. But you, you know that if, if it's just a harmonic oscillator, it will be a Hamiltonian which would be quadratic in the A's. And so you might think that if we can write the Hamiltonian uh, as, uh, as a Hamiltonian which has got only two powers of annihilation and creation operators, then we might be able to solve it exactly. So. If we, so if we had a second order Hamiltonian, i.e. no quartic terms, then maybe we could solve that exactly. So that is kind of like saying, um, if I have, the, for those of you who know uh, quantum field theory, now you, if you have a, a field theory, um, you want to try to find, um, you can write it down as a functional integral, and what you are trying to find is the, the best uh, Gaussian approximation to the functional integral of a theory that uh, describes the interacting theory. So, what, so, then, so if we had a second order Hamiltonian with no quartic terms, then maybe we could solve that exactly. And so what that says is, okay, let's try to find the best quadratic Hamiltonian that describes this interacting system with a quartic uh, coupling. When I say quartic coupling, 
What I mean is it has four powers of the annihilation and creation operators. So we're going to try to find the best quadratic Hamiltonian. And once we've found that, then what we want to do is we want to diagonalize that quadratic Hamiltonian. So when you're doing perturbation theory, you kind of can think of it in these terms. And, uh, but I'm going to do something uh, extra on top of this. So, so what we're going to do is the process that we're going to use is something extra. We will construct this, quartic, this quadratic Hamiltonian. using a so-called canonical transformation. And so what that means is that there will be a step in our calculation, which is non-perturbative. And that extra step means that we're able to get information that you would not be able to get just by pure perturbation theory. And, and so, so, so the implication of this is that we can calculate uh, easily non-perturbative effects. And in particular, that's going to be important when we deal with the, uh, the BCS Hamiltonian from uh, superconductivity, because what we're going to see there is that actually the problem of the ground state is a, is a problem which cannot be solved by perturbation theory alone. And that's why the problem of superconductivity took, well, one of the reasons why it took more than 50 years to solve uh, because you can't solve it by perturbation theory. It's, and so the, the method that we're using, it, it's critical uh, to have this, 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 uh, this ability. Okay, so that's, that's the, the strategy. So now we can uh, go on to the next step, which is I want to um, uh, uh, compute the, the uh, excitation spectrum. Okay, so let's see how we do that. So let's do this in, in several steps as usual. So the first step is uh, I'm going to write, whenever when I'm writing down the interaction Hamiltonian, uh, which is uh, somewhere over here. So it has, well, this one doesn't, but uh, where's my nice version of it? Hmm. Wait, 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 wait. What, what happened? Did we lose a page when the, when, and the thing crashed. Oh, there we go. Yeah. So here, here's our here's our uh, Hamiltonian. You can see that we have over here we have four sums over k, and then some stuff times a k dagger a k one a k two a k three a k four. So basically, every every expression in the energy is a sum over k of uh, a k like so, and so that is going to be um, equal to a naught plus the sum of k not equal to zero of a k like that. So the first thing we're going to do is, is, is substitute that into our interaction Hamiltonian. So let's go and write down what that gives us. So that's going to give us the following. The sum of, of k not equal to zero, h bar squared k squared over 
2m, ak dagger ak. And then the, the interaction term, which is going to, every term in that is going to be quartic. And there's going to be, think what's going to happen for every sum of over ak, we're going to have an a naught and then and then a little a k. So then we, because over here we have four of them, so we're going to get four factors of this all multiplied together. So I'm going to multiply them all out, and I'll tell you what you, what you get when you do that. So so the first term that you get is a term that looks like this. It's uh, u naught over two v a naught to the fourth. Then the next term that you get is going to be a term which has got two powers of capital A naught and two powers of A k's. So I'm going to get the next term will be u naught A naught squared over two V the sum over k not equal to zero. And then I'm going to have uh, a k dagger, a minus k dagger plus a k, a minus k plus four, a a k dagger, a k. So those, so I've got the quartic terms, which is all the a noughts multiplied together. Then I've got the cross terms with a naught, two factors of a naught, and two factors of, of the annihilation and creation operators. And then in principle, I've got terms that are higher order still, higher order, and they would therefore be a product of one capital a naught and three a k's. So I'm going to write those as, as uh, a k cubed. I'm just going to say that there's something of order a k cubed. And I'm not going to compute them because I only want to compute to quadratic order. So we're going to neglect those terms because we're going to assume that they're small. Okay, so that's how I write down, how I write uh, the, the Hamiltonian. And, and what, I, what I want to, uh, what, what the next step that I'm going to do is I'm going to use exactly this formula over here, how convenient it just popped up. So what we're going to do is use this formula, equation uh, square, and we're going to substitute that into the expression I just wrote down uh, in order to replace the a noughts with, in, and replace them by n's. So I've got here, uh, you know, the, a, a factor of a naught. I've got another factor of a naught over here. And so the next thing I want to do is I want to replace a naught by n. Use equation square to replace capital A naught by factors of n. And so that means that they're going to be replaced by factors of n and therefore by, by formula square also uh, factors of a k dagger a k. So that's what I'm going to do next. So let's go and uh, do the calculation. So I'm going to just write down the, the answer. Oops. Okay, so that's that's the that's the uh, that's the first term, and then the the second term uh, becomes. I'm going to write it down over here.
So now I have a bunch of, of A's and uh, notice that I've got a factor of two, uh, AK dagger, AK, whereas on the previous page, I had a factor of four, AK dagger, AK dagger. So that's just the, that's, that comes from um, making my substitution. Okay, and then of course there's terms of order A cubed, which we don't uh, care about. Okay, so that's, that's, uh, that, that's st step one. So let's, uh, the first order in, in, in perturbation theory is we're going to ignore uh, the A's altogether. So then that says that the ground state energy is uh, E naught is equal to N uh, naught squared times E naught uh, over over two b, okay, and so that's that's the that's the lowest order uh, approximation, and the if I want to compute the chemical potential, that's d d naught by d n, and that is uh, n uh, u naught where and it's just the number of particles over the volume. Okay, so that's the ground state. Now we want to do perturbation theory about that ground state. So let's go into step two. So the first thing I want to do to simplify it is I want to use a trick. There's lots of tricks as you, as you can tell. And one of the things is this, if I've got a sum of some function over k, over all of k space, like, like so, a nice way to write this down is to sum over k and also sum over minus k. Now, k is just a dummy variable, right? So if I sum over k and I sum over minus k, all I'm doing is computing the same sum twice. So if I just put it in a factor of one half in front of these things, then, uh, then I've it's just another way to write things down. Now, the reason I'm going to do that is because when you look at these operators that I have over here, um, well, on, on either on the, on the left here or at the top over here, on the top over here, you can see I've got factors of k and minus k all mixed up together. And in fact, they're going to turn out to be uh, a pretty, uh, quite complicated. And so this is a way to, to simplify things. So if we do that, then what that says, is I can write the formula for n, there's just the number of particles in the ground state plus one half, the sum over k not equal to zero, of a k dagger a k plus a minus k dagger a minus k. Okay, so that's, that's just a way of writing down uh, the number operator. So now that I've done that, I'm going to, I can write down the Hamiltonian in a kind of more, I don't know, symmetric way, I suppose. So that says that the Hamiltonian then looks like this, to half u naught n times n, and then it's this, it's a half sum over k not equal to zero. So the first term is this one, h bar squared k squared over 2m plus n u naught times the number operator, and of course, by doing my trick, I've I've, written, I've made all the terms be twice as many as uh, as I would have had before. But uh, but it turns out to be worth it. A minus k dagger, a minus k. Okay, so that's the that's the first term, and then I have the the so that's just the um, kinetic energy and just the ground state and then 
we have the terms that don't look anything like number operators, which are these terms. They don't look like number operators because they have um, two daggers or two absences of daggers. And whereas a number operator has a dagger and you know, a dagger A or something like that. So, so, that's, so, so these, these terms over here, these terms are the ones that are gonna make us uh, scratch, our, scratch our head. If we didn't have those terms, we could diagonalize this Hamiltonian. But we have those terms, so we have to figure out uh, some way to get around them. Now, what you may think is, well, they're still quadratic. They just don't have the, right, the regular form. So what we're going to do is we're going to make a rotation in the, in the space of annihilation and creation operators. So this is the, the next, uh, the next, uh, the next uh, major idea. So we're going to diagonalize this Hamiltonian. By performing a uh, linear um, I don't know what you call it, some sort of linear transformation. It's really a rotation. So what do I what do I really mean by that? So I'm going to define new operators. as linear combinations of the A's and A daggers. And I'm going to define them in this way. So, so the idea is, can I make some linear combination of the A's and A daggers in such a way that the Hamiltonian becomes of the form, you know, something dagger, something, in which case it looks like a quasi-particle Hamiltonian. So what we'll say is alpha K is going to be defined to be some, some complex number UK times AK plus another complex number, which we'll call VK times A with minus K dagger. Okay? And I'm going to define uh, alpha K dagger to be UK <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. New K A K dagger plus V K times A minus K. So those those are just uh, two new operators, and uh, these functions uh, U and and uh, and V <clears throat> the, these are going to be real. Everything just depends on the magnitude of K, so they're going to be spherically. Uh, symmetric functions of K, and we don't know what they are. So we're going to try to determine them. So we're going to find, we're going to use a criterion to, uh, to determine those, those things, and that's going to be part of the trick. So now that I've got these, uh, I've, I've defined this, uh, this transformation, let's find the inverse of this transformation. So the inverse of this transformation is to find uh, the A's in terms of these new operators, the alphas. So how do we how do we go about doing that? Well, the easiest thing to do is to take the uh, the top equation and multiply this by v k. So I'm going to uh, put a v k in front of that, and in this one I'm going to put a u k in front of this. Oops, didn't really want to do that. and put that in front of that. And then, so now I've got 
so the whole point about about doing that is is that the coefficients of the a daggers are uk and and vk uk times vk and so we can we can simply uh, subtract them okay so let's subtract are we assuming that u and v are real i'd said so yes they're real oh, sorry right okay so, so let's subtract them so then what i get is vk alpha k dagger minus uk alpha minus k is equal to minus uk squared minus vk squared times a of minus k okay so that's the, that's the first that's the first thing so that's that's the first uh, condition on these functions uk and vk now the next condition is i need i've got two equations so i need i've got two unknowns so i need two equations so I'm now going to stipulate that uk squared minus vk squared is equal to one. Okay, so I'm going to impose impose this as a as a as a constraint on the use, and you'll and you'll see why in a minute. And so what that says then is that the the, the term over here with with uk squared minus vk squared, that's just equal to one. And so therefore I can read off that a of minus k is equal to uk alpha minus k minus vk alpha k dagger. And uh, I can then find a k in a similar way. And so that gives me that a k is equal to uh, uk alpha k minus vk alpha minus k dagger just replacing k by minus k and then if i want to work out what a k dagger is i get uk alpha k dagger minus vk alpha minus k and so what i have then is oh, not just, what i have then is a um an inversion of this uh, of this transformation, and so 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 I'm going to just, just go on for just a couple more minutes, but not not too long. We're nearly done where I want to be. So so now let's ask about uh, what was the meaning of the constraint. So uh, I'm going to quite add this thing over here. And, and what I mean, uh, uh, what I'm, what, you know, it's clear what the, what the meaning is in some sense. Uh, first answer is it allows us to uh, invert the uh, operator, the, the, the transformation. So it, it, it makes sure that the transformation uh, doesn't uh, have a zero determinant, for example, which would mean that I wouldn't be able to invert it. So that's the, that's the first thing. But it has a physical meaning, and the physical meaning, uh, so that's answer one. Uh, answer number two is that uh, it has a physical meaning. And for that physical meaning, I'm going to compute the commutation relations of these new operators, these new fields uh, defined by alpha. So the commutation relation that I want to uh, compute is alpha k, alpha k dagger. And uh, so let's, let's compute that. So that is the commutator of uk ak plus vk a minus k dagger. So that's the first term and then commutate that with the uk ak dagger plus vk 
a minus k. So that's what that, that thing is. And now I, I, I simply go through all the various terms. So I've got commutator of, of all of these four terms. So I'm going to get uk squared times the commutator of ak, ak dagger plus vk squared times the commutator. So look at the, the, the v terms. So I got a minus k dagger, a minus k. And then I've got terms, all the other terms are an a multiplying an a dagger, some, some, something, like, something like that. Uh, actually, um, not an a times an a dagger, an a, time, an a times an a minus k, for example, so, something like, like this. And so those terms have got a k and a minus k, so they are different uh, terms. So I can say that those they have different momenta. So terms with uh, different uh, momenta, i.e. a k, a k prime, and so on. And and the, and those terms, a k prime and a dagger prime, a a dagger k, a dagger k prime. All of those terms uh, are equal uh, to zero. So what I've just shown you then is that the commutator for alpha k, alpha k dagger is equal to u k squared minus vk squared. And so by setting that equal to one, what I've done is I've ensured that the alpha k's uh, obey boson commutation relations. And since they obey commutation relations, uh, we can infer that they correspond um, they correspond to some kind of bosons. Okay, so so that's the uh, that's uh, step 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 three. And so next next time. We're going to do um, we're, we're going to do the following thing. We're, we're going to um, uh, what we're going to do next time. We're going to uh, write the um, interaction Hamiltonian in terms of the alphas. So we so far we wrote the interaction Hamiltonian in terms of the annihilation and creation operators, the, the real ones, the ones for the real particles. So now we're going to write the interactions in terms of the alpha k's. And what we're going to do is we're going to demand, we're going to require that the interaction Hamiltonian have quasi-particle form. In other words, we saw what quasi-particle form means. It means that the energy is just the sum of a bunch of particles with some dispersion relation, and, and, they, and those particles are non-interacting. So we're going to require that the interaction Hamiltonian has quasi-particle form, and so therefore uh, it looks like free particles 
I should say not free, let me, let me say, be a bit more precise, uh, looks like uh, non-interacting particles. in the alpha representation. And so to do that, what we're going to see is that anything that is not quasi-particle, uh, we are going to set equal to zero, and that's going to give us the equation that determines uh, u and v. So we have one equation for u and v, which is the one over here, the constraint equation. Uh, so what we're going to, what we're going to, this, requ this requirement over here, this requirement is going to mean that um, any, any terms which are not, uh, you know, alpha k dagger alpha k will have a coefficient that is set equal to zero. And then this is going to give us a second equation a second constraint on uk and vk. And so with that second constraint on uk and vk, we can calculate exactly what uk and vk are. And, and that way we'll be able to uh, calculate the uh, dispersion uh, relation of the quasi-particles. So in other words, We'll end up with a Hamiltonian, which has the following form. It has the form n times u naught times n. So that's just the number of the ground state energy. Then there's going to be a quasi-particle term. And that quasi-particle term uh, will look like this. and then stuff that we're going to ignore. And so what we'll be able to determine, uh, this thing here will depend on the U's and the V's, and we'll know those because we've got two equations and two unknowns. And so we have a system that can be solved. Well, we're not gonna do that now, of course, uh, so that, that we will uh, do on, 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 on Monday. And, uh, and that's how we will finish uh, solving this problem. So I'm going to uh, stop recording and I'll be happy to take uh, any, any questions.